Dan Woods, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's uh, good to be here. Where are you uh, physically in the world right now? Wait. Right now, I am in North Carolina. North Carolina. I always have to think about it because I'm on the road every week. Yeah, right. So you're home in North Carolina right now. No, home is Utah. Okay. Um, but I'm certainly, I'm certainly in the U.S. So, in, to, to, um, in that way, I'm at home. Cool. Stateside, motherland. <laughs> That's right. That's cool. right. So you are the uh, the global head of uh, intelligence at F five. Um, yes. You started yep. off your career as a cop. Was it a beat? I, I heard you say beat cop. Did you say street cop or beat cop? Well, both are they're synonymous. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I drove around in uniform in a patrol car, responding to calls for service. And uh, I have to admit, you know, most people are, are drawn to my my FBI and CIA background, but my time as a beat cop was uh, the most impressionable experience I've had in my life. Why do you say that? Well, you know, I actually went to college right out of high school and I didn't do very well. And then I became a beat cop and went from call to call to call, seeing, um, you know, the endless manifestations of ignorance, you know, and I, I saw my my future if I did not get an education. So I went back to college mm -hmm. and, you know, got you know, almost all A's and occasional B. So, you know, I, I go the first time and I do terribly. And then I go a second time and I do very well. And the only difference was my experience, um, you know, uh, seeing, seeing the, uh, the consequences of, of ignorance and um, it motivated me. Right. Well, that gives me hope because uh, I didn't do very well in college either. Maybe I should go back and do better. <laughs> it's never too late. <laughs> well, the key, uh, you know, the key is you go when you're ready. You don't, you don't go right. just out of high school because at that time you have to go when you're ready. Back to your... Uh what everybody else, as me and all of my listeners, are also going to think is interesting. You were, you went to the CIA, uh, and then the FBI. Tell us a little bit about those times there. We got we got to hear that too. Sure. Yeah, I went uh, um, to the CIA as a cyber operations officer. This is right after be being a police officer for about five years, and I loved that job. I mean, it was a great job. I traveled the world and uh, met with our our human intelligence sources and helped them. Um, you know, it, we helped expand their access to whatever information systems, computer systems, networks that they had some access to. And uh, we did all that in an effort to collect intelligence for the U.S. policymakers. Um, and I, I absolutely loved the job. Uh, it was it was hard to leave. So um, uh, police, CIA, FBI, and then bots. How did you get there? How yeah. did that happen? Yeah, yeah I certainly didn't think when I was in college or working a beat or was a young man, think, yeah, I'm going to grow up someday and be a bot expert. Um, but <laughs> as I learned more about cybersecurity and became more exposed to the world of bots, I became fascinated by them. Um, and I mean, I saw some fascinating things, you know, when I worked for the government. But when I got mm. to uh, a startup called Shape Security, um, this is about seven, eight years ago, prior to the uh, F5 acquiring Shape Security, um, we started to see these bots launching attacks that were just huge. I mean, uh, think of a, a large retailer. You know, you have a, an online account of this retailer. You log in, you enter your username and password, and then you go shopping and you buy things. You might have a credit card associated with that account or a gift card. Uh, well, we would go and look at the login traffic and we would determine, and this is the part that was jaw dropping to me, that 98 or even 99% of all login traffic was from malicious bots. Um, that mm. seemed really high to me. Um, and in fact, the first time it happened, we thought maybe we something was wrong. Uh, and then we you know, analyzed the data, reanalyzed the data, and sure enough, uh, it, it was correct. 98% of all the traffic was from malicious bots. And now, since then, we've seen it over and over and over again. And I just, you know, over the last seven years, I've all I've done is study bots. They're, the, the people behind them, or not the people, we don't identify them by true name, but uh, the motives. Uh, we understand exactly why the automation is taking place against which applications, for example, login is heavily targeted, mm -hmm. forgot password, create account, um, you know, this, even the seat mapper on an airline's uh, uh, website is targeted by bots. It's uh, virtually every public-facing application is targeted in some way. Mm. 
So the word bot, I mean, like, uh, I have a loose idea of what a bot is, right? It's like, uh, but what actually is it? What, like, the definition of a bot? Well, I guess just think of a series of lines of code software that automates some process. Um, typically, it's a process that uh, is done over and over and over and over again the same way. And rather than having a human try to do it, uh, this repetitive mm. task, people will write uh, software. And sometimes it's you know five or six lines of code. Other times it's hundreds or thousands of lines of code. But the point of it is to automate some repetitive process. And and I should I should add that not all bots are are bad. You know there are there are bots that are attempting what we call credential stuffing, where they're just trying various username and password pairs in the, on the login application of lots of enterprises. And because of the way you know consumer habits to reuse username and passwords, you know they take over a lot of accounts. So credential stuffing is clearly malicious. That's one bookend. At the other end of the spectrum, you have the Google bot. It's not a bad bot. You know it goes out and indexes web pages so that we can all find stuff on the internet quickly and easily. Mm. And in between the, the clearly malicious bots and uh, the Google bot. Are, are really just countless bots. Some of, some of them are malicious. Some of them are just a nuisance. Some of them are good. Uh, and uh, that's been my world for the last uh, seven years. Mm, interesting. Who, um, I've been having other guests on the podcast and we're talking about ransomware groups, right? And how professional they've became. And, you know, there's ones that are, you know, specialists in breaking in. There's specialists in, you know, the, the ransom part. Uh, who are making these bots, the malicious ones? Are they also a part of some, you know, criminal enterprise that could be associated with ransomware groups, for example? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's criminal organizations and in, even individual criminals who develop kind of an expertise in monetizing the, the takeover of accounts. Mm -hmm. So maybe some real life examples would be useful. You know, you, you probably have traveled on airplanes. So you probably have uh, a username and password to log into your airline account. Maybe you have uh, airline credit from from uh, flights you've canceled. Maybe you have you know half a million or a million frequent flyer miles. Um, you have a lot of personally identifiable information in that airline account. And then uh, what, whatever I just said about the airline account is probably true for your hotel accounts and your retail accounts, your bank accounts. You have all these online accounts. So. Um, these attackers, they they try to take over those accounts, get into mm -hmm. them, and then depending upon what's in the account, they have different techniques for monetizing what's what's in the account. So, for example, um, everybody's been has has experience with a gift card. Um, maybe it's a uh, it's a gift, like if somebody handed you a I don't know an Amazon gift card or maybe a gift card to a to a to a e-commerce site. Um, if you want to know the balance of that gift card, somewhere online is a web application where you could put in the card number and the PIN and say check, and it'll check. It'll tell you what the balance is. Um, you know, if, if, if it's a $100 gift card and you use it a couple of times, you, you want to monitor the balance. So um, the, here's the key, though. Uh, all that a bad actor needs to steal that gift card is the 16-digit card number and the PIN. And there's a finite number of those. So they will go to these check balance applications, use a bot to just put in every possible you know, gift card number and PIN combination. And eventually, they're going to find one with a balance. And once they find one with a balance, they can sell it uh, on a secondary market and keep the money. Um, so what's mm -hmm. interesting is I, was, I have this, uh, this, this presentation where I show a bot that I wrote that checks my gift card balance at, a, at a, a check gift card balance application. And I've been showing that for about two years. It's, I think it's six lines mm -hmm. of code. And, um, but the demonstration shows my 16 digit card number and the pin. It shows them both in plain text. So my audiences can see them. And I know that that's all they need to steal it. And I was wondering at what point is, is someone from my audience going to steal that gift card balance and the answer to that is it, it took about two years but then someone from my audience took it from me really <laughs> two years later yeah yeah <laughs> how yeah. much did they get $25 25 dollars. 25 US. A symbolic sum <laughs> yeah. so um these, these I, I would assume uh taking a step backwards I mean uh f5 the reason that f5 you know has you, you and your team working um 
focusing on bots is because you're trying to help these enterprises to uh, decrease the risk of these bots harming their company, right? Exactly. <clears throat> yeah. So um, what are some of like, the biggest uh, use cases, like um, the customers that are the most worried about this? You, you mentioned airlines and you know, people with, uh, or companies with gift cards and sort of rewards programs and stuff. What are some of the other uh, uh, large, important use cases that uh, you well, prioritize? Well, um, s- scraping. Scraping, which isn't really an attack, it's not malicious, but third competitors and third parties will scrape entire e-commerce sites. Um, we, we saw one e-commerce site that um, was scraped repeatedly and then recreated in Russia. Um, so a, a Russian citizen would go to the Russian site, uh, place an order, and then the Russian site would go to the European site using automation, using a bot, uh, buy the item, ship it to a reshipper who would then repackage it and ship it to the Russian customer. So this Russian site, they didn't have to maintain an inventory. Uh, they didn't even really have to design a website. They just they reproduced the entire European site in Russia and and you know changed the language. Uh, they used all the pictures and product descriptions and the prices. They just all they increased. So they they you know they they bought it for you know I don't know uh, eighty euro and then and then sold it in Russian currency for some premium. And they do this with many many uh, e-commerce sites. So it's it's think about this. It's just an organization that sits there like in a laptop from anywhere in the world, and, and with internet access, they can just you know scrape entire e-commerce sites and you know uh, spin up uh, clones of those sites that are making money. Um, and another use case that's been in the news recently, at least in the U.S., is the Ticketmaster. You know the fiasco at Ticketmaster when it came to the Taylor Swift concert. Mm-hmm. Um, bots took down the the uh, the Ticketmaster application because they were trying to buy all of these tickets and then they would resell them on the secondary market for a premium. And um, I mean, their their uh, their brand was dragged through the mud, at, you mm-hmm. know, at least in the U.S. Uh, yeah. So, and then now there's additional scrutiny on them for um, you know for being a monopoly. Uh, so my my guess is they would have much preferred to rewind and go back uh, a few months. And put in a really good bot defense solution so that you know all the Taylor Swift fans could get their tickets. Yeah. Um, we see the same side of uh, same kind of automation for sneakers, uh, where you know some shoe company will do a shoe drop and it's some limited edition shoe, and bots will buy them all and and sell them on a secondary market, which frustrates the loyal customers uh, because you know in order for them to buy them, they're not you know they don't they're not paying three hundred, they're paying three or four thousand dollars for the shoes. Um, we right. did a real quick. We did a, a, a workup on one of these organizations that were just buying sneakers and reselling them. And this isn't, um, it, you know, a couple twenty-somethings uh, working from home making uh, an extra fifteen hundred dollars, you know, U.S. They're making millions of dollars, millions. They're buying thousands of pairs of shoes and reselling each for a significant premium. So there's a lot of financial mm-hmm. motivation. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of those things that you just mentioned, you know, like uh, scraping a website and copying it in Russia. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure if that's legal or not, whatever. But I mean, they're definitely not. Uh, they're definitely creative. <laughs> the people that are doing this, yes. you kind of have to give it to them. Like, uh, yeah. 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 In fact, I hear some people describe them as attackers. I'm thinking, are they attackers? I think they're just they're entrepreneurs, very uh, creative and imaginative. Tech they're coming savvy, yeah. up with scrappy. Mm. Yeah, scrappy ways to make uh, to make money. Although occasionally, like when they scrape the airline fares or hotel fares, uh, hotel prices, you know, think about when you when you if you want to know what it's going to cost to stay at a particular hotel, you put in the city, you put in the dates, and then you pick a room, and then you're told this is what mm-hmm. it costs. Well, bots will do that because they they're they're trying to scrape all the hotel prices, but in doing so, they lock the entire inventory. Because once you pick a room, uh, the hotel will hold that room for 15 minutes to give you a chance right. to complete the reservation process. But if you're a bot mm. and you're really not, you're, you have no intention of completing the reservation process, all you wanted to do was scrape the price, then you're locking the entire inventory for the hotel chain. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, craziness when it comes to some of this automated activity. There are a lot of unattended uh, consequences. Yeah. 
So you've been working with this, um, <clears throat> what do you call it, salt uh, shape security. That was back eight years ago, you said. So how has the awareness around these sort of um, problems uh, developed since then? Uh, the awareness is growing uh, quite a lot. And sometimes people misinterpret that to think that the bot traffic is growing. And I don't think the bot traffic is growing. I think uh, probably eight, ten years ago, it, it really it was uh, ubiquitous. It was everywhere. Bots were scraping sites, breaking into accounts. Uh, it's just over the last eight years, thanks to companies like Shape Security and F5, the, the awareness, people's visibility into that bot traffic is now uh, increasing. Uh, but I don't want anyone to confuse that with thinking there's more bots today. No, there's just uh, a cr increased awareness. Mm. And uh, I mean, by now, haven't all the haven't all the companies that actually have uh, skin in the game to you know keep bots out? Uh, haven't they have already invested in these sort of solutions, or is is it uh, what? Why, no. why are they holding uh, well, what happens is you know they'll they'll try to block the, these these sorts of bots by IP address. And then the bots will just change IP and then they block that IP. Mm -hmm. And it, it turns out to be a game of whack-a-mole. Um, we, mm -hmm. we don't block by IP address or any attribute that can be so easily changed. Um, I'm of the belief you must collect what, what we call client-side signals. Uh, you interrogate the browser, you collect behavioral bi biometrics, uh, you attributes from the network layer. And in the totality of all those signals, you can make a really uh, high confidence uh, determination as to whether or not the traffic is uh, good or bad or, you know, human or bot. And a lot of companies, they don't, they don't realize that. And they're, they're still engaged mm -hmm. in the game of whack-a-mole. Uh, and what they don't realize is that these attacks are coming from tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and even millions of IP addresses today. So the yeah. enterprises, their security teams are usually pretty good at identifying, you know, the top hundred or a few thousand noisiest IPs that hit some rate limit, but they miss the long tail of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of IPs that are used only one or two times because they're not hitting any, any rate limit. So mm -hmm. what's very common is we'll meet an enterprise, uh, I'll look through their web and mobile applications and tell them with high confidence that this application, this application, this application are probably under significant bot attack. And uh, they'll have maybe capture in front of it, and I'll educate them and explain mm -hmm. how you know, human click farms solve those captures uh, all day long. And then we'll go online, d deploy our client side signals, do the analysis and come back to them and say, you know, I know you estimated 20 to 30 percent of your traffic was, was bot traffic. But in, in reality, it's 96 percent of all your traffic is bot traffic. Mm -hmm. So they're trying. Uh, most enterprises are really trying, but they they're underestimating the sophistication and the motivation of the of the organizations behind the automation. Uh, so they're 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 losing that game. Now, what's interesting is there are some organizations who are not trying because they don't want to know how many uh, bots they have and that social media companies uh, oftentimes fall into that category. Because as you as you likely know, you know, a social media company's worth, its value is typically rooted in the number of daily active users. So if you go in and say, look, I know you think you have eight million uh, users, but you actually only have, you know, eight hundred thousand or five hundred thousand. That's devastating news to the social media company. And they just assume not not hear that. So mm -hmm. there are some organizations that have a reverse incentive, and they're really not that motivated to, uh, to, to do anything about the bots. They are, certainly want to look like they're doing something about the bots. Uh, and they'll, they'll probably take out the low-hanging fruit, the ra rather unsophisticated bots, but they're not going to try so hard that they eliminate all of them because it will just negatively impact the value of their, of their company. Right. So you're not exactly Elon Musk's uh, best friend. <laughs> Well, uh, what's interesting is prior to the acquisition, um, uh, Elon Musk quoted or tweeted uh, my picture and a link to one of the articles that were written based on my predictions. Because I, I estimated that uh, probably more than 80% of all Twitter accounts are fake, uh, driven by bots, probably more than 80%. And everyone else was predicting, you know, 20%, 30%. But I, I've, I've been doing this a while. We've gone in line with social media companies and saw 99% mm. automation on login. 
um, and they have a reverse incentive. And I wrote a bot that automatically creates accounts at Twitter. I didn't encounter any countermeasure. When I when I took all the sophistication out of my bot and just you know just started trying to create as many as I can from the same IP address, then I got their countermeasure and it was a captcha. So you know th- those are really the reasons that that you know there's a huge incentive for fake accounts in social media, huge. Uh, mm-hmm. And then there's a marketplace. A marketplace. You could buy fake accounts. Um, in fact, I created a Twitter account, and I paid less than a thousand dollars U.S. and and that took my fake Twitter account to have uh, zero followers to over a hundred thousand followers. Um, so mm. you know, it's it's the it's the demand for fake accounts. It's the marketplace that provides them. It's the reverse incentive. It's the lack of a meaningful countermeasure at Twitter. And every time I've seen those four attributes in a social media company, uh, we've seen, you know, 99 percent automated login traffic. So I stand by the 80 uh, percent the, you know, uh, and then the acquisition uh, you know, closed. And what's interesting is the I, I actually think there are fewer bots on Twitter now than the 80 percent. Because it, it appears Elon Musk is taking it seriously. He really does want to get rid of the bots. The problem, though, is, um, you know, of all my fake accounts, he's only identified maybe 40,000 of the 100,000. So um, I still have 60,000 fake accounts that are a bit more sophisticated. And his, his current approach is, is not going to be sufficient to identify all of them. So, yeah, F5 can certainly help Elon Musk solve that problem that he's promising to solve. Yeah. Well, uh, so wait, uh, just to just because it's interesting. So when he posted the picture of you, was he actually using you as like a, Hey, yeah. Trying to get the price of Twitter down sort of thing. Well, <laughs> what he, he just said does, is something like, this doesn't seem like 5% because Twitter was alleging five, 5% of their accounts are from bots. And I said 80%. So he, he tweeted yeah. a link to my, uh, to the article and my picture saying uh, it sounds higher than 5%. I think that's uh, what the mm-hmm. actual tweet was. Interesting. So um, for those companies that are uh, that don't have a reverse incentive, right, that actually don't want bots in their sites, what sort of uh, countermeasures um, are typical to put in place? Well, what we see people use are CAPTCHA. And I, I mentioned that, you know, yeah. I mean, I went to work for a Russian human you know, click farm solving CAPTCHAs just to gain the experience. And I I think I had solved, I don't know, 40 or 50 CAPTCHAs and I hadn't earned one penny US yet. So it's very exploitative. Um, and as long as there are humans, uh, thousands of humans willing to solve CAPTCHAs for bots, you know, all day long, then bots uh, will be able to navigate their way right around a CAPTCHA. And so then all CAPTCHA will do is create friction for legitimate customers. So we typically see enterprises try to use CAPTCHA. Uh, and then eventually the the attackers uh, and uh, the third parties behind automation just, you know, engage human or a subset of them will engage a human click farm. And then they'll do battle with those. And then eventually they'll maybe go to one of our lesser expensive competitors and then they'll do battle with the attackers. They typically come to F5 when they've tried everything else and they still have a bot problem because um, we just have a lot of uh, a lot more experience and a lot more sophisticated uh uh, technique for dealing with some mm. of these, uh, these this automation. I cannot believe there are human click farms. I have never heard that before. That is, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, uh, you go to just two caption. I hate giving them publicity, but go to two caption dot com and you'll see how many of their humans are online right now, waiting to solve the captcha, waiting to be tasked. Um, yeah, and I've, I've got a whole uh, video on. If you just you know Google my my name Dan Woods FBI or F five and CAPTCHA, you'll come across one of my videos, um, and and other good videos that are produced by others that really explain in detail uh, how to use a human click farm uh, to solve CAPTCHAs. Um, I mentioned this earlier that I've written bots, but I didn't say that's important. Is I'm not even a programmer. Um, I mean, I studied engineering in college years ago. Uh, and I, you know, back then I wrote an occasional program for, for school, but I'm not a programmer. I, the reason I didn't become a programmer is because I wasn't very good at it. Um, but e- even I, I, as a non-programmer, uh, was able to write these bots. So it's not, it's not complicated. Um, a lot of YouTube videos uh, will, will show you how to do it. You could buy bots. You can, 
You know, it's I, I, in a weekend I was able to automate the creation of accounts on Twitter using a bot. So, mm. you know, if I can do it, imagine what a, a skilled uh, collection, a skilled team of programmers could do. Uh, right. You know, with some effort. The really extremely uh, sophisticated bots. If you, if you have any examples of those, what are they doing? Yeah, we do. Those are the ones who are uh, really good at mimicking human behavior. They have entropy in their mouse movements and their keystrokes, uh, and they, they navigate workflows in a way that is kind of consistent with uh, the speed that a human would navigate a workflow. Uh, they come from IP addresses and autonomous systems and regions of the world where the customers they're trying to imitate come um, so, mm. and, and they're really good at spoofing devices and to give you an example of what I mean by spoofing a device. If, uh, in, in, uh, in tech, there's this something called a user agent string that kind of lets the server know what kind of a browser and device they are. The user agent string might say something like Chrome uh, on an iPhone. Um, well now the browser knows uh, how to, you know, serve that content to you because it knows your device. Well, if, if a, a bot will, will say that they are, you know, maybe Chrome on an iPhone, but they need to be doing everything consistent with being Chrome on an iPhone, like the way they render emojis or the way they do floating point math, uh, the number of CPUs, the amount of memory, the size of the screen. There are just so many other things that they have to get right to convince us that there really are a Chrome operating on an iPhone. Uh, and if they get one or one or two of those details wrong, which they typically do, uh, then we know that they're they're spoofing their their user agent string and they're lying about who they are. And legitimate customers have no incentive to lie. It's just it's just bots and criminals uh, that that right. do that. So um, the the really sophisticated organizations are the ones that are really really good at spoofing those signals. And it's very hard to identify that this is not a real person. But, you know, luckily, we have some incredible uh, JavaScript engineers who have uh, who've done some things that uh, we never talk about publicly, but they're really advanced signals that these uh, bad actors mm -hmm. don't don't mm -hmm. know to spoof. And even if they tried, they wouldn't be able to. Uh, so that's what separates yeah. us from from pretty much everyone else. Yeah. So but you uh, you and your team probably love those sort of really advanced bots, right? Because that's you're also playing sort of a game of whack-a-mole uh, in, a, in a sense, right? Because uh you have to develop well, your product. Yeah, and, and that's when they develop. And that's fair. Uh, and you're hitting on something that's really important that we try to educate our customers on. That it isn't enough to take mitigating action in on a transaction that's from a bot at, in real time. You, you know, you try, you do your best to do it in real time, but you have to have to you have to have the you know the humility uh, to to know that some of those attackers are going to retool and become more sophisticated, and they're going to get by your real-time protection, which is why you must have this kind of a second stage where that's where your you know, AI and ML is running on aggregate transactions and all the you have human analysts pouring over all those alerts, just looking for anything that our real-time defense missed. Uh, and that's a necessary component of defense. And a lot of organizations, they overlook that. They think just the real time is sufficient. They overlook the the fact that attackers retool and they become more sophisticated. So it's a, you have to constantly look for anything you may have missed. And then you need the, uh, the ability to update your real time defenses to deal with the newly discovered uh, malicious traffic. Um, and, you know, some vendors might recognize that, yeah, you're going to need to you know look for anything we miss, but that's on you. And if you find something we miss, you got to let us know, and then we're going to charge you PS hours to deal with it. Where at F5, we offer what we mm -hmm. call a, an outcome as a managed service, where we, for one, one price, we just keep them safe. Because then, think about it, if we made money every time the attacker retooled, then we'd have a reverse incentive. We'd make more money um, if the attacker kept retooling. And we wanted to eliminate that reverse incentive. The more an attack retool, attacker retools and gets by our countermeasure, uh, the, the less money we make. That's the right type of incentive. You want a vendor who is incentivized mm -hmm. to keep the enterprise safe, not make more money. Right. Interesting. There's a, this has been a really fun conversation, uh, Mr. Woods. I'm re really enjoying myself. I've never thought of these things before. Um, random question, but it has the word uh, botnet. So botnets. How does a botnet work? Yeah, so what happens is these bad actors need to be able to task millions of computers with launching 
the automation. It could be an attack. It could be scraping. It could be like those bookends I talked about. It could be anywhere in between. But they need a device, a machine that is capable of launch of running the bot. You know, the, the bot I wrote, I was talking about. You know, I can run a bot on one computer, uh, but that's not you know a, that's not a botnet. It's when I run that bot on millions of individual devices when it becomes a, a botnet. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it used to be that, you know, attackers were looking for compromised machines, and they still are. They use compromised machines. Uh, They use compromised IoT devices, anything that they can do to take over, you know, a machine at an IP address and then use it to engage in the automation. That's what, you know, uh, attackers are trying to do. But more, more recently, these attackers are able to come from residential IP addresses, that aren't compromised. And the reason why is so many um, uh, individuals, they want maybe a VPN and they don't wanna pay for it. So there are services out there that says, well, you could use a VPN and in exchange, you have to let others um, tunnel through your computer uh, when you're not using it. And they're thinking, well, I save money on a VPN and it doesn't really negatively impact uh, you know, my performance, because they only do it when I'm not using the computer, right? No mouse movements, no keystrokes, no, the CPU isn't, isn't uh, being utilized or, or peaked. Um, you know, three o'clock in the morning, what do I care if, you know, my, the office and my computer is, uh, is contributing to this VPN service to a bunch of people I don't know? Because during the day, I'm using their computer to surf the web uh, safely. So it's these VPN services that where a lot of people, I'm talking, you know, millions and millions and millions of people are allowing their computers to be used when they're not using them. So it's just, it's provided um, attackers and, and third parties who launch this automation with a virtually unlimited amount of devices they can use. So um, that that's the trend is we're, we're seeing the, the move the move from you know all compromised machines or machines in in hosting facilities uh, virtual machines and hosting facilities to oftentimes the attacks are coming from residential IPS and that IP by the way it has malicious traffic coming from it during uh, some times of the day and then perfectly innocent traffic coming from it from other times of the day so it's uh, it's it's a fascinating uh, transition uh, for these botnets. And you mentioned one thing that um, I want to I want to clarify. You're you're right that in a way, once we start doing battle with these attackers, it too is a game of whack a mole. But um, you know, if it takes us minutes to retool and push a new countermeasure, and it takes them days uh, to overcome that countermeasure, that is a game that we will win. Um, and the, the goal isn't to is it to make it impossible to use automation? That's a fool's errand. You cannot make it impossible. What you want to do is make it too expensive for the attacker. The, you want, it's just not worth it anymore. And they, they, instead of retooling over and over again, they just move on to a softer target. These guys have FM. I'm going <laughs> next target, right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, I, I guess my um, last set of questions for you. Um, DDoS. Uh, I know that you uh, F5 is also in the DDoS business. So the, these uh, bots and you know uh, whatever. I'm, I'm I'm assuming you just put something in front of the application that checks all the traffic that's coming in, and then you let through the traffic that you deem to be legit, and then the rest is goes away. What's the connection between bots and DDoS? Well, the, the typically the bots that we are stopping are trying to accomplish an objective, like check to see if credentials are valid. They don't want to tip over mm. the server when they're because they, they want to know are the credentials good and the other example i said well they're scraping entire e-commerce sites they can't scrape the site if they bring it down um so mm. sometimes that they accidentally bring it down uh that's why stopping the automation is is uh, really the important thing to do now ddos is going to be automated as well so we'll we'll stop it because it's it's automated uh, it isn't typically done by you know one person sending a bunch of packets from his or her machine. It's because there there are packets being sent from all from millions and millions of devices in a large volume. Uh, that's done using automation. So I guess to be um, really technically accurate, we we don't really stop credential stuffing or scraping or DDoS. We, what we stop is unwanted automation. And it just so happens mm. that that is a key component for all these other malicious activities, even SQL injection. 
Uh, typically, a mm-hmm. person is not going to manually try, you know, a SQL injection. They're going to program a computer to try uh, lots of different strings stuffed into many different, uh, you know, fields on thousands mm-hmm. and thousands of different websites. Uh, all that is going to be automated, and the key is to, you know, do something to stop the unwanted automation. And by the way, gain visibility into all the other automation. Um, so that's really what we specialize in. Cool. Well, sounds like uh, F5 has a place in the future of security for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's not just a load balancing company anymore. They've gone through quite a few yeah. acquisitions over the last four or five years, Shape Security being one of them. And uh, you yeah. know, in the past, when I was working for a startup that gets acquired, I didn't last in the in the acquiring company more than you know a year. But I'm loving what I'm doing at F5. I'm excited about the direction they're headed. I believe in the direction they're headed. So um, I uh, I'm still here. It's been uh, four years now at at F5 or three to four years at F5, and I'm um, having a really good time meeting with uh, people who are suffering from all the consequences of bots, and then you know being able to to help them deal with it. You know, it's uh, stopping, Mm -hmm. credential stopping is rewarding, but we, you know, one security team said something to us uh, not long ago that really, really motivated me. And that was, you know, since we deployed F5, uh, you know, uh, we could all, my my coworkers, we could all spend, finally spend time with our our friends and family on nights and weekends. And that just really hit home because, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Francois, our CEO, talks about us being a people first uh, company. And, uh, and yeah, I, uh, I felt really good knowing that something we're doing is allowing families to spend more time together. Well, Mr. Woods, that's uh, it's a great way to end this episode. Thank you so much for, well, thank you uh, so much for having me and expertise. It's been yeah, a pleasure. I've, I've learned yeah, a lot. So uh, I'm glad I get to go over this again and learn more so I could, uh, take your words and sound smart to all my friends too. So, <laughs> well, I'm telling you real quick before we adjourn all of your listeners and you, your friends, your family, everybody needs to be using a password manager. If you're not, um, you need to start because uh, and don't reuse passwords. So that's that's the the really important takeaway from from today. Mr. Woods, thank you so much for your time today, and uh, looking forward to uh, following you and hearing from you in the future. Thanks very much.